Today's guests are Christina Fernandez Valle, We join their conversation in the faculty lounge. The muscle contracts so the skin so you can feel, um, so that the organ secretes whatever it needs to secrete. And um, in order for that long electrical wire to send the electricity down, it needs to be, it needs to be insulated like those telephone wires that have different colors on the outside. So the Schwann cell is what makes that a lipid sheath or a lipid wrapping around the axon so that it um, allows the electricity to go down the axon to the target organ or muscle or skin. So I study how that Schwann cell does its job. Interesting. In some ways, it sounds like you know some of the things you do are similar to some of the things I do. <laughs> um, basically, you're looking at these uh, cells that they act like a means of communication. Is that right? Yeah, this Between is all brain about. and certain organs. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now, uh, was this the type of research you were interested in when you were a graduate student? Can you tell me a little bit? I mean, we have talked about so many things. Uh, but I've never actually asked uh, you about your, uh, you know, graduate program. Where did you do it? What did you do? And uh, how did you come into what you're doing? Okay, so basically I was an undergraduate at Florida International University, which is in Miami, which is another state school that competes with UCF for a lot of the funding. Um, and I was studying biology there with the idea of being a medical doctor. But I found that after finishing my degree and working in biomedical research, I was working at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Miami, mm -hmm. doing work on steroid biosynthesis and tumors of the adrenal glands. And I would go to Grand Rounds in the morning, at 7 a.m. in the morning, with all the MDs and the trainees, the interns. And I found that I, I empathized so much with the patients that I was afraid if I made a mistake and I would hurt someone, that I couldn't sleep at night. So I decided I felt more secure in the research lab. So in the research lab, you work with test tubes full of DNA or protein. At most, you might have a laboratory mouse running around. And I just felt more comfortable there. Mm -hmm. So I developed an interest in the nervous system because that is the central command center for the entire body. It dictates your personality. It dictates y your behaviors when you wake up, are you an, a night owl or when or are you a morning person? Um, and it regulates your heart. Every organ is regulated by the nervous system. So there was this particular picture in a book, I remember. It was an electron micrograph mm. of this axon. So the axon is this round circle and it's clear and then it has layers and layers of this dark material around it and that's the myelin sheath. And I looked at this picture and I said, that's an amazing structure. Mm -hmm. I wonder how that's made. So um, I just like to understand how things work. And I thought right. a clinician would tell you, these are your symptoms. You need to take an aspirin or an antibiotic. But they don't really know why you have the infection. Why did that bacteria come and invade your lungs? And I was more interested in mechanisms. So I decided to go into the PhD program at the University of Miami School of Medicine. So the first year actually was spent doing a lot of clinical court, a lot of medical school courses with the first year medical students because I was in a neuroscience program and I studied cell and molecular biology, which is my PhD is in cell and molecular biology with an emphasis in neuroscience. So you do the first year with the medical students. You do neuroanatomy, you do um, neurophysiology, and then you go back into the research lab and spend the next four years in the research lab right. and taking specialized courses for graduate students, which basically retrain your brain how to think. Interesting. Because when you're an undergrad, they tell you what to read. You memorize, and you put it back on a test, and you get an A. Science is like, we don't know how this works. You've got to figure it out. So there's nothing to memorize. So you have to start developing new synapses in your brain so that you basically question everything and then figure out how to experimentally answer them. You must have been very good 
you know, with dissecting uh, frogs and everything when you were young? Is that right? <laughs> because I was the one who was the champion at freeing the frogs <laughs> <laughs> from the lab. <laughs> but you must oh. have been always good in doing that. Well, you know, in, in my, you know, private, you know, all-girls Catholic high school that I went to in Miami, mm -hmm. we didn't have that much um, access to dissection of animals. We might mm -hmm. have done a frog, I don't remember. It was mostly like either worms or plants. We did a lot of plants. Mm -hmm. So, and I remember having a butterfly collection and my sister would not let me keep my butterfly. <laughs> I had this, um, I had caught with a net a butterfly and I put it in a glass <laughs> jar and I was going to anesthetize it or overdose it with something so I could pin it into a board. And my right. sister just cried and cried and I had to release my butterfly. <laughs> So I never collected animals. I just was not that interested in, mm -hmm. um, I, was, I was always more interested in why people are sick and how to make them better. That's interesting. Well, you know about my research that, you know, since I focus on international relation, I have to actually uh, travel and uh, spend a great deal of time in countries that I study. What about your research? When you conduct your research, what do you do? Well, there is an opportunity to travel because once you start publishing, you find that the people that understand what you're publishing are basically right. are not always, you know, they're not down the hall, and they're definitely not in Orlando. They could be anywhere in the U.S. They can be anywhere in, in the world. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of opportunity to interact with people that are in Europe and that are in Russia, they're in South America, and you can start emailing, and opportunities come up. This summer I'm going to be in Italy for a conference and talking to an, an, uh, co well, they're becoming colleagues. They're... Um, scientists, they were in the U.S., now they're in Italy, and we published at the same time papers that had opposing points of view. Right. And for a while we would like be um, competitors because they thought that this molecule, this protein that allows cells to stick to their environment, to their mm -hmm. surroundings, was important in the function of my cell that I study, which is a Schwann cell. And I would argue, no, it's this other protein. So we would have this discussion. We would meet at conferences and we'd always say, you're wrong and I'm right. And now we've decided after 10 years that, why don't we work together? So I'm gonna go give a conference in Milan in a couple of weeks, and then mm -hmm. we have written a joint grant together to the National Institutes of Health, where they're going to um, create some research tools that I need to use to answer my question. Right. So I now have this expertise that's it's different from their expertise, but we work, both work on the same system which is how the Schwann cells that are in the peripheral nervous system, how do they insulate axons so that the electrical communication can go from your brain to your toe so you can move your toe or right. you can feel that you've stepped on a nail. So we, both labs work on that. Mm -hmm. So, but my day-to-day -day life is very different than yours. Because <laughs> when so. I go to work, it's a research laboratory. But see, there are similarities, I was just thinking. Uh, when you mentioned that uh, you were, you know, intellectually competing with uh, a colleague, mm -hmm. and I like those type of colleagues <laughs> when they <laughs> present, you know, ideas so different from our own ideas because that's, you know, for us that would be learning, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, you you have taken obviously the natural step, the nec natural next step, which is a, com a colleague that you were competing, working together uh, on the same project, and I think this is wonderful. Yeah, it's it's much more fun. Right. It's much more fun. And then actually because you have both been training your brain to think about a certain problem. So all right. of your mental energy that we have at work or even in our sleep is focusing on the same problem. So now we have okay. like four or five brains and we would have never met otherwise. And yet we want to share our thinking. And then now we need someone to say, am I thinking correctly? What do you think about this problem? So we actually challenge one another. And I think at the end... Um, when this grant gets funded, we have to resubmit it to the NIH again in, I think, July or October. Um, we'll probably come out with fascinating new information that will help diseases that affect, like, there are certain forms of muscular dystrophy, which right. is a weakness of the muscle, and the protein we study mm -hmm. is used by, um, is made by neurons, the nerve cells in the body, it's made right. by muscle cells, and it's made by the Schwann cells that insulate and form the myelin sheath around the axon. And there's a certain part of your body called the neuromuscular junction where the nerve and the muscle unite. 
Okay. And there's three cell types there. And they all use similar proteins, but those proteins allow them to carry out different functions. Mm. So when there are genetic mutations in this protein called an integrin, right. either the muscle dies or becomes so weak that it can no longer supports a, uh, a person's weight. So right. they end up being wheelchair <coughs> bound. Um, there are other conditions where the beta-1 integrin is involved in keeping cells together so you have a good connection. And if the connection isn't tight, this myelin sheath, which is mm -hmm. really a spiral wrap around the axon, it starts to unravel. Right. And then the electricity doesn't go down the axon, it gets short-circuited. So you have no control of that muscle. Right. So that muscle might be alive, but now the electrical information didn't get to it. So there's a, there's a lot of different physiological repercussions to having one simple protein have a mutation. So in some ways, we are actually studying disorder yeah. within a cell. Right, right, exactly. Now, if you study disorder, then um, could you tell me in, um, you know, in terms of I would understand, <laughs> um, right. for example, what causes cancer? I mean, because what I heard, and I don't know how much of that is correct, is cancer cells are actually our own cells that they, you know, somehow become cancer mm -hmm. cells. So, so something obviously happened in, in our own cells that they change. Mm -hmm. So what happens? So the theory about cancer biology, you're totally correct. Cancer cells are our own cells that are now misbehaving. And instead of following the orders and following instructions, they decide that they're not listening to any anyone. They're going to do whatever they want. And what they do is they start to make too many copies of themselves. They start to divide. Mm -hmm. And one cell becomes two. Those two cells become four, become 16. And then you have a tumor. Mm -hmm. And the tumor can stay in the tissue it's at, or it can metastasize. So cells will start leaving the tumor, enter the bloodstream, and they travel to distant sites. So you can have a, t a tumor mm -hmm. in the colon that goes to the brain or the bone. Mm -hmm. And that's when you get really um, metastatic um, terminal cancer. And usually that just destroys the function of, of the tissues and, and the human being. So what cancer theory is that um, some people are born with genetic mistakes in their DNA. So okay. the DNA is the code for, for you. It only has four letters in this genetic code. And it can make you and it can make me. So what it needs to do, these four codes are, um, are linked together over and over and over again. And they specify how proteins are made in your body and in each cell. I see. So every cell has the same genetic information, but every cell is only going to exercise some of that genetic information to become a nerve cell or a liver cell or a lung cell. So sometimes if you have a predisposition to specific type of cancer that runs in your family, it's because your genetic code has an error in it. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean you will get the cancer. If you have breast cancer that runs in your family, you might have a mutation in a protein that can lead to cancer. But right. it may stay silent your whole life. But as you live, you're exposed to environmental um, insults like chemicals that we spray on our yard to make right. our grass look really green, or the insecticide we put on our rose bush, or the chemicals we eat, mm -hmm. and the sunlight that's involved in skin cancer. So all of these different environmental um, triggers a mut another mutation. So now instead of having one mutation, you have two mutations. As the older you get, you end up with three, four, five different mutations. And they can be in different proteins. And each protein acts as a policeman. I so see. they're sitting there, they're the policeman of the cell, and they're making sure that the cell behaves a certain way. Right. If the mutations kill off your police force, then you have a cell that can divide and become a cancerous cell because your cell has safety nets built in, so many different safety nets. And what we find is the mutations that cause cancer fell into one of those policeman proteins and knocked out two or three different safety nets control systems, and that's when you get a cancer. That's interesting. So, in other words, uh, there are two sets of, uh, you know, variables or factors that they can 
cause a law-abiding cell, <laughs> mm -hmm. for lack of a better term, right. <laughs> to become a rebel cancer cell. Mm -hmm. Some of them are basically, uh, you know, led by the, our nature or what in we inherit, right. and some of them are by our nurture or our environment. Is that right? That's absolutely right. That's interesting. That's very yeah. interesting. Uh, again, I see some similarity between what you do <laughs> <laughs> and what I do. Uh, you study, in some ways, rebel cells. Mm -hmm. I study rebel individuals. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, what about, uh, well, for example, when uh, we talk about current news, uh, if you recall, a couple of days ago, they talked about uh, finding some uh, serine gas, uh, nerve gas, uh, in Iraq, in one of those uh, roadside bombs, um, what is a nerve gas, and what is sarin? What does it do? Right. I mean, how does it kill? Yeah, so sarin was the same. I think nerve gas that was found in was it a Tokyo subway years ago? I think so. Right. Yeah, that a number of individuals killed. So nerve gas is a compound that affects a specific enzyme in your body. Okay. And this enzyme is called acetylcholinesterase. And I happen to have done my PhD, spent five years of my life studying acetylcholinesterase. So what this enzyme does is that it terminates neuro, neurotransmission in a synapse. So for me to breathe, right. my diaphragm muscle assists in breathing. Right. And um, the information to breathe is transmitted down a nerve to a synapse where the nerve, where the same neuromuscular junction where the nerve and the muscle combine, there's a molecule called acetylcholine that is secreted by the nerve to the muscle and it makes the muscle contract. Mm -hmm. And there's an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase that is supposed to break down the acetylcholine so you don't overstimulate the muscle. And what happens is that nerve gas inactivates that enzyme so now what you have is a buildup of neurotransmitter at the junction. So the muscle is getting way too much information. Right. And it actually paralyzes the muscle. Interesting. Be and the muscle stops responding. So your, your diaphragm muscle stops moving, so you basically asphyxiate. So in other words, this agent, this you nerve gas, mm -hmm. somehow gets involved in the communication between brain and muscles that mm -hmm. we use to breathe right so if it you know it changes that yeah, well it breaks down somehow that uh, communication or as you said right overwhelm it but with information mm -hmm. and then the muscles they stop you know doing what they're supposed to so the individual actually suffocate is that Suffocates. right oh my god yeah well i hope uh, they don't find any more of that type of gas i know and it's it's unfortunate, but um, nerve gas, and there's a lot of poisonous, venomous, venomous snakes. Right. They target the venoms that they secrete when they bite you, and the reason you die is the same thing. They target the same system, that same communication system between the nerve right. and the muscle, and um, will actually paralyze muscle. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Now, in what direction is your research moving now? Okay. So right now, I've so since 1989, when I finished my PhD, what we need to do as scientists, as molecular biologists, is that we need to go into another level of training. It's very right. rare when you finish a PhD and go right into faculty position. We have to do what we call postdoctoral fellowship or postdoctoral training. Right. So you have a PhD, you go change your laboratory, and you work on a different problem usually mm -hmm. than your PhD. And you can spend anywhere from three years to 10 years in this pure research environment where you're really honing your skills, training your brain to think the way it needs to think. And then you're ready to go find a job as a faculty member. So from 89 to about 95, when I came here in 96, I worked as a postdoctoral fellow and as a 100% research scientist at the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis, which was a spinal cord injury group that started in Miami um, due to um, the efforts of a number of people. One was right. um, a neurosurgeon who got tired of treating spinal cord injury patients mm -hmm. and seeing them end up in wheelchairs. And one was Nick Bonacati, who was a Miami Dolphin football player whose son went to Clemson or he was in college football 
and he suffered a spinal cord injury that left him a quadriplegic in a wheelchair that he moves mm -hmm. around by blowing through a little um, tube. Right. And he can has enough control of his neck to blow into the tube and he can move his wheelchair around. So they got together and started fundraising seriously and hiring a group to specialize in spinal cord injury. So that happened a couple years before I finished my PhD in Miami. And then wow. when I graduated, they recruited a new faculty member from Washington University in St. Louis to lead the second phase of the research. They changed directorships. The director went back to Sweden, the original director. So I joined that group and I was studying Schwann cells, which is a really interesting cell because when you have injury to your nervous system out in your periphery in, in your in your limbs okay. you can injure a nerve in the axons that are the individual nerve fibers that are in the nerve so the nerve is like a, a bundle of, of axons so you take all these telephone wires and put them together right. the whole large structure is the nerve so um, when you injure that nerve in your finger and your arm it'll grow back and one of the reasons mm. it grows back and reconnects so you can regain movement of your extremity of your muscles is because Schwann cells, my favorite cell, is there. And they are very responsive to their environment. They will do whatever the environment tells them. If they're in contact with a mature axon, they will wrap that axon, make a myelin sheath, and allow the electricity to go down to the muscle. So they act like a repairman? Yeah, they're a repairman. <laughs> if you injure the axon, the Schwann cell goes, injury, injury, you know, danger, and it de-differentiates, it stops making myelin, Right. it goes back to a very developmental stage, divides and makes lots of these Schwann cells. And the Schwann cells secrete molecules that entice the axons to grow back. So the Schwann cells start making food for the injured axons and mm -hmm. nurse the axons back to health and show them the way back to the tip of your finger mm -hmm. where you had the injury and the axons grow back. And when the axon finishes growing, from where I got injured, if you had a wrist injury, right. it'll, it'll dive, all of the nerve along here will dive back. And then okay. when the injury occurs, the Schwann cells make lots of copies of themselves, start secreting the food, the axon grows right back. Interesting. And then once it's there, the Schwann cell says, oh, we're done growing. Now it's time for me to myelinate. And it myelinates again the axon, so the electricity goes down. Because an axon that doesn't have insulation doesn't work. That's what happens in multiple sclerosis. Different areas of neurons that are in different areas of your brain lose their insulation and you end up with um, abnormal sensation in your mm -hmm. extremities and you can end up with muscle weakness because you lose the myelin sheath that's in the um, neurons in your spinal cord and in your brain. Right, now your favorite uh, cells. Can we find them all over our bodies, or are there more in certain areas? Yeah, that's than a great I question. These cells are only made in peripheral nerves. So your peripheral nerves are exit the, the spinal cord, which is right. surrounded by the vertebral column. So then as the, the axons exit your spinal cord, okay. that's where Schwann cells start to live. And they'll live all along the peripheral nerves, but nice. they're only there. And what's interesting about them is that they have the ability to um, nurture or nurse neurons back to health. Right. In the central nervous system, which is your brain and spinal cord, that's why spinal cord injuries and head trauma is so damaging, you don't always recover function because the cells that are there don't have the ability to nurse neurons back to health. So there's a large group of people that want to put Schwann cells into spinal cord injury or into areas where it's, uh, multiple sclerosis patients have lost their, right. their myelin um, mm. insulation, and they want to transplant these cells into those different areas and see if we can get those Schwann cells that are transplanted into foreign environments mm -hmm. to nurse those neurons back to health. Yeah. If you remember a few years ago, we were so sad to hear about what happened to Christopher Reeves. <sighs> I mean, Superman, you know man who could do anything and uh, you know he nice hurt himself right um what you know what you're studying is exactly like what happened to him exactly is that right? in fact i was at the mummy project as a senior researcher there when that happened and he was treated in one of the best places in the in the states for injury which is in virginia which wasn't far where he had a spinal cord injury and what he did is he severed the spinal cord right here at the base of, the s of his um, spine where the spine fuses with the head. Right. And um, it left him a quadriplegic. 
and um, he now has the Christopher Reeves Foundation, mm -hmm. which has generated a lot of money. He fundraises all the time now. That's become his reason to live. And he, I've, I've met him and I've had listened to many interviews by him. Mm -hmm. And he really didn't think he had a reason to live. His injury was so severe. But now he um, has the foundation. He funds a lot of scientists. And what was really interesting is that there was dogma. Mm -hmm. Talk about ideas. We were talking mm -hmm. about ideas earlier, how you have to replace uh, an idea with another idea. Right. When we learn in science is that a nerve cell never grows back. So you're mm -hmm. born with so many nerve cells. Right. At the end of puberty, you start losing nerve cells. And that's why mm -hmm. we age. That's why we lose our brain. That's why we have Alzheimer's. Is once you lose a nerve cell, they're gone forever. And the dogma was that um, you, spinal cord injury had killed neurons, and there right. was no way you'd ever get better. So n there was no research in the area because okay. all the scientists were being taught, these fresh minds that come to college and they want to learn, they're being told, don't study spinal cord injury or brain injury because there's no way you can re regrow back a neuron. Mm -hmm. So that was the dogma. And then during the time just preceding Christopher Reeves and w after Christopher Reeves' injury, he has funded so much research into the area and has refused to believe that there's nothing that can be done about this loss of neurons that he now has you know, helped to change the way we teach s neuroscience in college. We say that you can grow new neurons. We don't know how to do it, but it can happen. And there's examples of neurons actually being born in the brain of old people. That's interesting. So, so in other words, by just surviving, is that right? Uh, this in itself is a success story. Yeah, is that right? Just it's like a miracle. Or that's And actually surviving and having the money to treat himself, to go through physical therapy. Because when you had a patient who had spinal cord injury, the doctor would say, I'm sorry, you're in your wheelchair for life. There's nothing we can do about it. Learn to live with it. Go to occupational therapy. Now they say, no, there's things you can do. Exercise. They can put electrical stimulators on the muscle, right. to keep the muscles contracting artificially so that if the nerves do grow back and the electricity is restored, you have a muscle that's receptive. Um, there's a lot of physical rehab.